We are going live here with our Finger Lakes watch party. I am bringing out all the big guns today. We have our cast of locals from the Finger Lakes area. If you guys are joining us, I hope you have grabbed a glass of wine at this noon lunch hour because though we're not in Europe, we are celebrating the Finger Lakes, which is known for its wines. And I wanted to introduce everyone who's here. If you guys are joining us today, where are you coming from? Please type it into the chat. We'd love to know where you're viewing from today. Please share that information with us. And I'd like to introduce the guests that we have as we're going to watch the Finger Lakes PBS episode today. And I'm so excited to have Megan Frank with us. She's from Dr. Constantine Frank Winery. Megan, say hello. Hi, everyone. Nice to be with you all today. And Megan has provided um, me with this rosé that you guys voted on for me to be drinking today. It was Riesling or rosé, and rosé seemed to have win, won the thing. What, do you, what can you tell us about this wine, Megan? Sure, yeah, so this was freshly bottled. It's from our 2020 vintage. It's a blend of Cabernet Sauvignon and Cabernet Franc, and it's a really nice dry rosé for the, for the season. As it well. is really nice. So that's gonna make this live even more fun, you guys. <laughs> If you don't have a drink in hand, you might want to grab one. Brett's with us from Seneca Lodge. And Brett, you have a lot going on in the background. I've been to Seneca Lodge, so I know there's so much history there. Oh, yes. Welcome, everybody. Welcome. And we have Dave DeGolier here from Corning in the Southern Finger Lakes. Dave, where are you joining us from, though? Are you down in Corning or are you back at home? Dave might have been frozen there for a second. So we'll go to Eric. That's the beauty of a live, you guys. If you're just joining us, we are live today, as you can see. We have Eric Goldschmidt joining us from the Corning Museum of Glass. Um, Dave, I think, is back. Say hi, Eric. Good afternoon, everybody, from and a beautiful, sunny Corning. Yes, and I'm excited. So we're going to talk about so many different things today. We're going to watch this episode. Dave, I wanted to let you um, get a chance to say a quick hi to everyone. Okay. <laughs> We've, Dave's frozen in time over there. But that's, okay. that's why we have multiple guests on today, guys. <laughs> I was having a little I was having a little technical trouble here. Uh, nice, okay. to, nice to be here with you. Great. So um, let me just check that we are cross posting to some different pages here and live on Facebook as well. Um, I'm going to actually save this over here and, and, um, Brett, tell us a little bit about, well, actually Megan, tell us a little bit about Dr. Constantine Frank winery. Cause we're going to be seeing that later in the episode today. If you guys are just tuning in, please let us know where you're coming in from. We're going to be showing this episode and, um, going to all the places that these locals, um, have brought brought me to. And um, Mincy's telling us we're live now because for a second I was wondering, um, just some delay on Facebook. So if you guys are just joining us, please let us know where you're coming in from and we're gonna be showcasing this episode. But Megan, tell us a little about, about the winery because I'm excited for folks to see that later in the episode that we're gonna see today. Yeah, absolutely, Darlie. So we are a four generation family owned winery on Cuca Lake, um, which is one of the Finger Lakes here. And we focus on Riesling, on Rosé, Pinot Noir, but we make over 40 different wines with uh, over 17 different grape varieties. So there's a lot going on. And my great grandfather, Constantine, uh, and his name adorns all of our labels. Uh, he was the first to successfully plant the Eastern, or excuse me, the European varieties in the Eastern United States. So that's um, sort of his legacy and we're excited to carry it on. And we're excited. Um, Krista just let us know that she's joining from Blacksville, Ohio. If you guys are joining from different places, we have lots of people with us from the Finger Lakes today. I'm coming to you from New York City to, from my apartment. If you see my cat in the background, she likes to make appearances sometimes. But we're going to be watching our PBS episode that was filmed in the Finger Lakes. It's a half hour episode and we're going to be stopping and giving you guys some behind the scenes and insiders information on it as we um, do this live today. And if you guys have questions, please ask them in the chat. We are here to give you information, to share with you, um, and give you insights into this part of New York State, which is a great place to go, especially in the summer and fall, and the spring as well. But really, really excited to share it with you. 
So I'm actually going to go ahead and um, kick this off. If, and, and by the way, I also want to remind everyone to please pay attention because we are going to be doing some trivia today and you will be able to win some prizes, a cookbook, as well as some travels with Starly luggage tags and swag, which is always fun. But we can't wait to kick this off with you and engage with you, answer your questions. If you have comments, um, if you have questions about our filming, if you have questions about where you know these locations are, um, we're really excited to share them with you. So I'm actually going to now bring it back to the folks who are going to be starting us out with this expert information. And that is Dave and Brett. You guys are the first guests today for the Finger Lakes Live. Um, and again, if you guys are tuning in, let us know where you're from and let's kick off this episode. Hi, I'm Darlie Newman, uncovering fascinating history and beautiful villages and nature escapes in New York's southern Finger Lakes. We're getting our adrenaline pumping in Elmira and Watkins Glen, hands-on with art and history in Corning, learning about the fastest man on earth, Mark Twain, and more. Welcome to Travels with Darlie. Nestled between the Pennsylvania border and Lake Ontario, New York's Finger Lakes region is comprised of 11 finger-shaped lakes, lots of vineyards, and a variety of small towns and cities, which offer arts, culture, and farm fresh food to locals and visitors alike. We're discovering the southern portion of the Finger Lakes, meeting locals to guide us to Seneca Lake, Cuca Lake, and through Corning, Hammondsport, Elmira, and Watkins Glen. We're starting our adventures taking flight in Elmira, New York, at one of the earliest destinations for soaring in the United States, Harris Hill. Okay, I'm pausing it here because I wanted to share with you guys that this is a really exciting first segment. This is our first stop in the episode. And if you guys ever wanna do something that's super adventurous, this is definitely it. Dave, I want you to tell people a little bit about this experience. Yeah, it's pretty spectacular. Um, so we're actually up on a on a hill, very high, actually over the valley. And um, as you'll demonstrate soon, um, you're in a glider, which is actually a motorless plane. So there's no motor. You're towed up by a small, you know, biplane or or single uh, wing plane, and uh, let loose, and you soar, you glide over the valley. Um, and it's a pretty exhilarating experience and uh, also very serene. A lot of people come away from that and just like, it's been a real cool moment for them. Yeah, and I actually was able to talk to Brett a little bit about this before this live. And I asked him if he'd ever done this experience. Brett, tell us, tell us about it. Yes, about five or six years ago, we did a uh, staycation sort of thing. And our first stop was the uh, Paris Hill for the uh, plane ride, well, not the plane, for the uh, sail ride. And it was very fun and enjoyable. I, I've always liked adventure, so to go up in a plane without an engine was really neat. It's pretty wild. So we're going to play this segment and you guys know I'm up for any adventure. And I would say I try to find an adventure in each location. If you've seen our show Travels with Darlie, you know, that's to be that's definitely true. And this was this is one that I definitely recommend for you guys if you're going to this part of the Finger Lakes. We'll be experiencing what it's like to fly in a glider, also called a sailplane, a motorless plane which uses columns of rising air called thermals to soar through the sky. I'm going to put you in the front seat. You OK with that? Okay, am I gonna have to drive? You don't have to drive. <laughs> Brian Regal is my pilot, and he's got loads of experience soaring. If you look out on the wings here, you see the spoilers deployed, okay. Okay. so you don't want to put your fingers in that slot. No touching anything okay. here. I'm not gonna touch anything up here. To take off, a powered aircraft tows us up. Once we reach the right altitude, the cable is released, and we're on our own. If the conditions are perfect for soaring, mm -hmm. How long could you be up in the air? Hours and hours and hours. Really? Five, six, seven hours. Wow. Gliding took off as a sport in the 1920s and 30s, with competitions being held in the 1930s at Harris Hill. In those days, the competition was all about staying up in the air for as long as possible, but later would include acrobatics in the air and specific timed routes. And while the changing leaves are beautiful as we peacefully soar through the air, 
Ryan wants me to experience some of the more adrenaline fueling aspects of soaring. We're gonna pull up and we're gonna turn right over the right wing. You ready? Yeah. So look to your right. Whoa, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> How's that? That's crazy. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that is wild. That was really, <laughs> my stomach was turning. I would, I have to say, so I get motion sickness that, and it's so funny because I travel all over the world and I've done all these small planes and experiences, but I was feeling a little ill after this day, not ill enough to be sick. But I was like, but it was fun. It was really, and I think we did a little extra because I was filming as well, but it was an awesome, awesome experience. And so what do you recommend if people want to, to try this out um, if they're visiting the Finger Lakes area? Well, I mean, in one thing, uh, you know, everybody's uh, sensibilities are different. So the nice thing is the pilots would give you kind of what you want, you know? So if you just want to like keep it easy, they'll do that. And if you want to take, you know, do some exciting stuff, they'll, they'll be all for that too. Um, well, so right now on the weekends between now and mid June, the sailplane rides are going on up at Harris Hill. And then once mid June hits until um, Labor Day weekend, you know, they'll be going up daily. So, um, you know, I think with anything right now, it's good to call ahead um, and kind of, you know, schedule your visit. Um, but it's uh, it's something that's it's definitely should be taken, taken advantage of if you get a chance. Yeah, if you guys like anything to do with aviation to the next part of this segment, is definitely going to be of interest. And if you like museums, that's something that I think is interesting about this part of the Finger Lakes. There are lots of really cool museums. And then there are places that are not museums that have a lot of history, like Seneca Lodge, where Brett is coming um, mm -hmm. to us from today. So there's lots of history in this area. While I thought my flight was exciting, it's nothing compared to some of the early adventures in motorless flight. To get my land lakes back, I walk over to the National Soaring Museum where over 80 years of soaring history is on display. Gliders have changed pretty dramatically since the days of the Wright brothers and other innovators, and seeing the evolution here is impressive and a little daunting. The National Soaring Museum will certainly make you think about how far we've flown since then. In addition to aviation history, Elmira is also rich in Mark Twain history. At the Center for Mark Twain Studies at Elmira College, Dr. Joseph Lemack sheds further light on Twain's ties to the area. So his wife's sister uh, had a home about three miles from where we're standing at a place called Quarry Farm. And she invited Olivia, his wife, and Sam Clemens, Mark Twain, up there. And he found that he could write really well at the Quarry Farm. Um, and for over 20 consecutive summers, uh, Mark Twain comes up here to Elmira, up at Quarry Farm. And in a small octagonal study, he writes some of the, the greatest works of American literature. Twain Penn works like The Adventures of Tom Sawyer and Adventures of Huckleberry Finn in the small study overlooking the Shemung River Valley. In 1983, Quarry Farm was gifted to Elmira College, and the Elmira College Center for Mark Twain Studies was born. Twain study was relocated to the college campus, and today, students and travelers can visit it and the Mark Twain exhibit. Scholars think that he probably smoked between 20, 30 cigars a day. Cigars and cats. That's exactly right. What was his affinity for cats? Well, I think uh, the Twain and even you know his their family were really animal lovers in general. You know, loved horses, dogs, cats. My kind of folks. <laughs> <laughs> Twain's octagonal study was even equipped with built-in cat doors, so his four-legged friends could venture in and out during the day. I think the most fascinating thing about Mark Twain is the myriad of different ways that people can approach Mark Twain, whether it be race, uh, religion, economics. I think that's something that uh, people don't really associate with, with Mark Twain, but I think that's an important, really important part of his character. Mark Twain passed away in 1910 and is buried in Elmira, leaving a legacy for visiting Mark Twain scholars, students, and lovers of literature and history around the world in Elmira. Next, so I'm just gonna pause it before we go to our next location. 
Um, this, I thought, if you guys love history and literature, this is a really great stop. And if you love animals, I was fascinated, Dave and Brett, hearing about Mark Twain and his cats. And it reminded me of Hemingway and Key West and the cats that are there. Um, such, such really interesting information. And to go inside his study, you all, is really fascinating. You can see how um, he got his inspiration, especially because, Dave, tell us, like, the study was, we, we said it was relocated in the show. Where was it before? So it was in a, it was called Quarry Farm, uh, and it was actually uh, where his wife, uh, Olivia Langdon, her family uh, had this uh, place up on a hill. So it's up on a hill overlooking the valley, overlooking the Schmung River and Elmira, and uh, it just had this beautiful, it's, you know, very peaceful up there. There's not a lot of neighbors, uh, and he actually wrote about how it's, the, you know, the quietest of quiet places, and it was the, 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 uh, study was actually put near the edge of the property so it could actually see over the um the valley so he had that space to use for inspiration and brett is this another location that you may have visited throughout your life or that people really locals go to as well in the finger lakes area i have not visited the farm itself but i had gone down to the old the domes that they used to call them and horse heads and they used to do a Mark Twain show every year. They did that for I don't know how many years, but I think they probably stopped that around 25 years ago now. Yeah. I mean, maybe maybe someone down that way could get it going again. Interesting. And, you know, we have some fun comments coming in. Um, Derek Johnson was saying cigars and cats. What a combination. And it really yeah. is. Um, <laughs> Rick Baker, thanks for joining, saying great program, educational and fun. Thank you so much. And um, Patty O'Kelly was saying she grew up, or Patty, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not sure of the gender on this one, but grew up in Elmira, moved all over, but most people hadn't heard of the Finger Lakes. I began to think I imagined it, returned in 2017 and starting boat tours on Cuca Lake, currently in school in Ireland, sharing this live feed with classmates from India. So we are global here, Ireland and India today. So thank you for joining us, everyone. And again, please engage with us and share your comments, ask questions. Um, and we did have a question that I just wanna get to really quickly from Tim, who was asking, um, Dave, maybe you can answer this. How many gliders, if you have a small group, like, do you, is one person going up at a time? And how long are the flights normally? So, yes, one person goes up. As you saw, there's room for one person and a pilot in each glider. So uh, it's um, it's definitely not a speedy uh, experience. Um, the, the flights, it depends on the weather partly, and it also depends on what you, um, you know, what you are wanting um, and also how much, how busy they are. So they usually last about 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, sometimes they could last up to 45 minutes. It really depends on when, um, you know, if you go on a weekday during the summertime, you know, there's a little bit more flexibility than on the weekends probably. But, um, if you have a group, depending upon, again, I would contact ahead of time because so you can set up your flights to make sure folks are going. Um, there could be a couple people at the same time in the air, but it's one after that next uh, as far as takeoffs go. And um, Cindy is saying that she'd love to cover the Mark Twain farm. Um, mm -hmm. Roger is saying unbelievable history in the lakes. Would love to hear more about the original settler. So we might get to that later um, for our Q&A. Roger, stay tuned. And Derek is saying that he is coming to us from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. So we've got all types of um, folks from all over the world coming in today. And we're gonna continue on to the next location, which you guys are gonna love because it's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. This Watkins Glen State Park where we have these amazing waterfalls to discover. Next, I'm taking a hike along the Gorge Trail at Watkins Glen State Park, where over 800 stone steps lead visitors through a wonderland of waterfalls. 19 waterfalls within two miles, cascading alongside trails which we've hikers beside around, over, and under falling water. Environmental educator Josh Teeter is leading me through the park. Okay, we're coming up on Rainbow Falls here. And this is from a stream above that cascades over all year. In the late afternoon, once you're under here, if you look back through it, you can sometimes see a rainbow through the whole curtain. It's not until you walk the gorge trail and pass under and alongside thundering waterfalls that you can truly appreciate the power of nature. Amazing what water can create. 
Yeah. This is, a, this is like the perfect combination for gorge formations, the type of rock, the water here, the lake being down there. So it's all eroded back. 12,000 years ago, this was all solid rock. In addition to natural beauty, this part of the Finger Lakes is also known for its rich history related to racing. And I'm going to pause it right there because I want Brett to just briefly um, share his background and why he is an integral part of this episode and also here today and coming to us from a historic location at Seneca Lodge. Oh, yes, I was, uh, my family was part of the racing tradition in the very beginning. A um, young man named Cameron Argetsinger approached my grandfather, Don Brubaker, who was the president of the Chamber of Commerce at the time, about bringing a road race to Watkins Glen. And then my grandfather said, let's do it. And Cameron started organizing it with other locals. And in 1948, we had the first post-World War II American road race here in Watkins Glen. And we're going to see a little bit of that coming up in this next segment though is taking us to Watkins Glen International where this is a very cool experience again you guys I think it's an uh, experience that does get your adrenaline pumping and you'll see why and I'm just going to share some of the comments that are coming in Roger's coming from Connecticut and um, Victoria's talking about these areas are such a must visit especially for people that love poetry and um, Andy is saying, can't wait for Brett and Seneca Lodge to release their peach blonde beer. It's a Finger Lakes must try. So more comments coming in, but let's check out this next segment because this is another activity that I would definitely recommend if you're visiting this area. And we're getting our adrenaline pumping at Watkins Glen International. This is where the NASCAR drivers and lots of world famous people have driven. I am just an okay driver, never been on this racetrack. Any tips for me? Absolutely. We'll make sure that you take it uh, take it slow. For us, slow is fast. So if you take your time getting into the corner, uh, you'll be just like uh, you know the Jimmy Johnson of NASCAR, and uh, you'll be getting some good laps around this place. Travelers can sign up to drive the Glen in their own vehicle. As I'm following just behind the pace car, I'm hoping I can keep up kind of what you'll see on NASCAR weekend. <laughs> All of this hillside is gonna be full of campers. It's just a really cool atmosphere. Here we go, we're going under the I Love New York. Loving it on this track, I can tell you that. I didn't realize how much I like to drive fast. Um, once you get out onto the racetrack, your, your natural adrenaline takes over and uh, you just wanna go as fast as you can. <laughs> These guys and girls will go out here for six straight hours and race around this, uh, this full road course and just the fitness level. Yes, fitness is not something I think about when I think about driving. I think it's a sedentary thing, but I can feel it even now, just when we're taking turns, you, you are using different muscles. So we're working out, <laughs> who knew? Working out on the track. One of the most unique workouts you've ever had. Yeah. And definitely a memorable initiation into racing culture in Watkins Glen. Race fans have flocked to Watkins Glen even before Watkins Glen International was built in the 1950s. On October 2, 1948, the town of Watkins Glen itself was the setting for the first post-World War II road race. Drivers actually raced through the village streets along a 6.6-mile circuit. Glenda Gephardt, communications director for the International Motor Racing Research Center in Watkins Glen, is taking me for a ride along the old circuit, starting with a stop at the old stone bridge. So here we are on the iconic stone bridge. It's uh, a very important part of the original race circuit. The bridge goes over Glen Creek, down into the gully, and up again. It's all around the circuit people would be gathered. The first year there were about 5,000, and by the fourth year of street racing, there was some 200,000 people around the 6.6 mile circuit. When you drive this yourself and you think of those guys going around this circuit, the ups and downs and the twists and the turns, and they are averaging 64 miles an hour. It's just, it's mind boggling. They like to keep it fast here in Watkins Glen. We do, <laughs> still today. To check out those curves ourselves, we're driving the course, which had its start and finish in town on Franklin Street. And just imagine driving your race car 50, 60 miles an hour coming up through here. But the speed limit's 25, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's for us, yes. Yeah. <laughs> The circuit includes straightaways where drivers could pick up the pace and a ride to the finish line right in town. And just imagine the race cars are roaring down Franklin Street, right through the middle of town. 
people are lining the sidewalks, mm -hmm. sitting on the curbs, mm -hmm. standing on boxes. Mm -hmm. It just, what an atmosphere it must have been. So this is the stop before our next segment. And uh, I, I had a lot of fun. I thought it was so neat that I could drive on this racetrack where all these famous people have raced and then also drive through the old circuit. And Brad, I, I'd love you to comment on that as well and, and just share any thoughts you have on this amazing history in the area. Yes, it's nice, I think, what the track did, I'll say five years ago, but it's probably been longer, allowing people to go up and I believe it's at the noon time around lunch, and then they do it in the evening around 4.30 or 5, where you do a small donation to the track. And a lot of times they go to fundraisers. And then you get to do your two or three laps around the track, which years ago, they you couldn't even get on the track. But now it's a nice, nice feature that they allow people to do that. It is a cool feature. And... Dave, what do you recommend for people that want to have that experience of driving the Glen? Because Derek Johnson was just saying that he knew Watkins Glen was for the NASCAR races, but he's learning so much more now that a lot of people didn't know you could do all of these different adventures while you were there. Yeah. And I mean, um, you, the best thing to do is reach out to Watkins Glen International. You can go online uh, and find out how to sign up uh, because they have the drive your own vehicle at certain days and certain times. Um, so you can uh, sign up ahead of time to do that. Uh, and it's, you know, it's another way to be socially distanced right now, you know, and you're, you're in your own car. So it's not like, you know, you had someone riding with you, but most people would just be behind the pace car going around. Um, and it's really a neat experience because there's all types of cars on that track, which is normally, uh, you know, for super speedy cars. So it's cool. So now you guys get to see how the locals that we have on camera really share so much about their area. And that's what we love about doing this show, Travels with Darley, uh, because we have Brett here with us live today, but you're gonna get to see him now on camera. And one thing I will say about our show is we are not using actors. <laughs> These are real people, we put them on the spot, we turn on lights, we have cameras in their faces, and everybody is always you know, very relaxed. We're a small crew, me and three other people. So it's not an intimidating crew, I don't think, Dave. No, it's awesome. <laughs> Very inviting. Um, but Brett, I'm excited. Um, I'll be getting a lot of comments, Brett, on on the lodge and the types of beers that you have. So I think you're going to have to say something about that after we play this segment. But let's go to see Brett's segment here um, from Seneca Lodge. Further, we reach family-owned Seneca Lodge, which for more than 50 years has been an institution for motorsports racing fans and drivers alike. Not only did fans watch the historic first race from Seneca Lodge, but started the tradition way back then of celebrating at Seneca Lodge post-race. Owner Brett Brubaker joins us for a craft beer in the Lodge's main bar. On the walls, we have arrows, we have Formula One winner's wreaths, we have IndyCar winner's wreaths, which are present day. The sports car racing really comes here a lot, the six hour race cars, the Indy cars. I don't think they realize how much history has been here. What was it like to grow up here? It must have been really interesting. Well, it started with Cameron Ar Argett Singer approaching my grandfather about starting a road race. And my grandfather, Don Brubaker, was president of the Chamber of Commerce at the time. He listened to this young man from Ohio, and they decided to grab a few other guys in the area and brought the first post-World War II American road race here, right in Watkins Glen. So this is where it all started. This is where it all started. Young man's dream from Ohio and a couple locals to help pull it together. And now this small village has become a world renowned place for road racing. Not far from Watkins Glen. Okay, I'm gonna pause it there because as you can see, I mean, what Brett shared with us was just so heartfelt. And tell us a little bit more about your background today, Brett, because I know people are watching and they're saying, wow, what is what is everything? If they see this close-up photo now of these are all photos and, and memorabilia behind you. But tell tell us what's tell us what's there. Well, in this photo that you paused on, the uh, gentleman in the winner in the middle is Ricky Rudd. And he won, I believe he won two of the early NASCAR races here and he came down to the lodge after the race and signed a case full of hats and gave them away to patrons and some of the workers here too at the lodge. But uh, 
on the walls though, like you said, the arrows that you see, my grandfather brought national field archery to this area and they started letting the winners of the tournaments shoot their winner's arrow into the wall. Um, we did stop that about 12 years ago. I mean, more because of uh, not so much of the safety because we would clear everyone out, but it was, uh, they just stopped doing the tournaments locally because we just couldn't keep them up and compete with some of the other bigger areas in the country. The pennants on the wall that you see a lot of our early workers were college students and they would actually come and stay in one of the small cabins and work for the season when it was a much shorter season than it is now and they would bring their college up modern pennants and hang them on the wall and that's just grown into workers and then people who come to patronize the lodge they always like to see their alma mater on the wall so if it's not there the next time they show up they usually have a pennant in hand <laughs> well and i think dave will agree that if you guys are you if you're on social media this is a really fun place to go and have a beer and get a photograph taken and yeah. again we've, we've had so many comments come in um kathy was saying brett that I hope there will be a brew fest this year at seneca lodge i know things are Me probably, too <laughs> things are probably up in the air but that's exciting and um dave do you have a beer that you recommend people try when they go to seneca lodge yeah. um well unfortunately i i have a hard time with beer uh because of allergies and stuff but you know, Brent is brewing beer, so that's one of the reasons it's not just the beers that he has there. He has his own beers that he's brewing because um, he's part of the whole craft beverage scene here. Um, and uh, I'm sure there are, there are several that are quite recommended. I will say that I've heard really great things about the prime rib uh, as well, uh, the food there as well. So it's not just uh, a, a one-stop place. It's, it's got a lot, of, a lot going on. And part of the history of Watkins Glen, that culture, um, which you can see through the rest of the town, uh, you know, is there. The fact that the, the start and finish line is right in front of the state park is also wonderful too, because, you know, you can actually experience kind of both of those things, um, you know, in the same afternoon, which is really neat. And Brett, just so you know, we have some folks that have definitely visited you. Marsha is saying that the lodge's food is great. So I guess prime rib or whatever you want to order would be great. And do you have anything else you want to say before you, um, you two, head out and we bring Megan on and we'll be bringing, we'll be bringing Dave and Brett back you guys at the end of this for a Q and A. So if we haven't answered your questions, continue to type them in the chat. We're trying to catalog them, but also be here to ask them at the end of this episode. But anything you want to say before we, we bring on Megan for her segment coming up here? No, I'm just excited that our beers were starting to bottle some of our, our main three beers we bottle all the time now. And, We'll bottle a couple others throughout the season, like our seasonal peach blonde. That's going to be bottled, and probably in, it'll be released next Wednesday. So, so we're excited okay. to get our beer out to more places than just Seneca Lodge. Uh, I would just, I would just add, um, you know, the we saw that there are 19 waterfalls in Watkins Glen State Park. The nice thing about the area is there are waterfalls on the side of the road. Uh, you can pull over, you're going to see a lot of the outdoor experiences that people are finding the last year or so have been really resonating with people. And, you know, as I was told by a colleague in Watkins Glen, actually, she said, you know, nature's open. And uh, between the lakes, the rivers, um, you know, there's just a lot of outdoor experiences to be had. Um, and uh, I think that's just an important thing for people to remember. There's a lot of opportunities. And Brett, we just want to take this one question from Barb because it seems like it's very pertinent right now, but she was asking if you need reservations for dinner. Uh, we do not do dinner reservations. It's first come, first serve. And until it gets busier, there's usually not much of a problem with any weight. Well, I am um, adding- but One thing that on what Dave said real quick is we are located right across the street from the south entrance of the state park also. So you can do two yeah. birds with one stone right and actually everything in this area is really easy to get to and drive around. So I'm going to, I'm going to say goodbye to Dave and Brett, but they will be joining us again in a little bit. And we are now focusing on Megan Frank, who is joining us from Dr. Constantine Frank winery. Great. Yes. And Megan's segment is coming up. So we're going to start to play this segment and then we will be again, taking your questions and share comments if you have them, but this is another great place right now because you can walk around a beautiful vineyard and be outdoors as well. 
heading to another one of the Finger Lakes charming villages, Hammondsport, where getting out on the water is a must, and history is highlighted through local museums and vineyards. We're starting our adventures stand up paddle boarding on Cuca Lake with Robin Losey of Cuca Water Sports. You want to balance your weight right here. You want to keep a soft knee to take the waves as they come. A few strokes on one side and a few strokes on the other side will get you going. Well, I don't want to fall in today, but now I'm getting hot. Yeah. So I'm going to try not to, but it wouldn't be but that it bad. It would be kind of refreshing. <laughs> The more shallow waters of this Y-shaped finger lake make them warmer than some of the neighboring lakes. As it's my first time stand-up paddle boarding, Cuca Lake's calm waters also make it a great place to learn. After I get my bearings, Robin and I paddle out pretty far, checking out the shoreline and getting in a good core workout too. The Southern Finger Lakes are rich in aviation history and a great place to learn about one of the area's most famous pioneers who used Cuca Lake for many of his trials is at the Glen H. Curtis Museum in Hammondsport. Curator Richard Lysenring takes us on an insider's tour. Glenn did a lot of firsts in his life from the motorcycle era in 1907 with the world land speed record and followed by the first uh, publicly announced officially witnessed air flight in the United States in 1908 uh, and just continued on from there. Everything he did he just did not want to lose. Vintage aircraft, motorcycles, automobiles, boats, bicycles, and even travel trailers tell the story of Curtis's myriad innovations, often tested in daring ways. Born in Hammondsport and only attending school up to the eighth grade, Curtis started racing and building bicycles as a teen and would go on to manufacture motorcycles. Glenn produced motorcycles between 1902 and 1912. Many of the motorcycles that you see here are contemporaries of that period of time. These are uh, these, wild. Yeah, they are. Uh, <laughs> uh, this one here is probably one of the most significant pieces in our collection. This is a exact duplicate of the record-breaking bike from 1907. Now, at that point in time, Glenn was developing a V8 engine for aeronautical use, but he wanted to see exactly how powerful it was. So he had his workers put it on a motorcycle frame, and in January of 1907, he took it down to Ormond Beach, Florida for the speed carnival that was taking place that year. And he was allowed two miles to build up speed, one mile to hold the speed and a mile to stop the bike. <laughs> it actually took him a mile to get the bike to stop. Well, he's got an airplane engine on a bike. <laughs> exactly. Well, when he was finished, he found that he uh, had broken a land speed record of 136.4 miles an hour. But he did say it satisfied his need for and quest for speed. I'm sure it did. He probably <laughs> felt like he was about to take off and, uh, yeah, into the did. sky. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Curtis held the fastest man on earth title for four years. In 1908, he would win records in flight, flying the June Bug biplane over 5,000 feet, staying in the air for one minute and 42.5 seconds, setting a new record for both distance flown and time in the air. A reproduction of the June Bug is on display at the museum. Curtis pioneered the design of seaplanes and flying boats and tested out many of his inventions in Hammondsport on Cuca Lake, where today, an annual Wings and Wheels Festival in September honors his legacy, and the many innovations still in use from one man with ingenuity, determination, and the courage to go fast, high, and far to create something new. So I'm just gonna pause it there, so Megan, Tell us, first of all, we saw some stand-up paddle boarding on Cuca Lake. I know you spend a lot of time on the water. I do, and Darlie, you're a professional. That was very well, well done. <laughs> and uh, Cuca is really a perfect lake um, for any sort of water sports, you know, paddle boarding, kayaking. Actually, the name Cuca in the Iroquois language uh, directly translates to canoe landing. So really the perfect lake for recreational water activities. And also Cuca, you know, we're talking the Finger Lakes, 11 deep glacial lakes. Cuca is sort of in the middle in terms of its depth. So we start to warm up around July. So it wouldn't have been the worst thing in the world if you had fallen in, Darlie. I think it would have been really refreshing. But lots of places where you can rent equipment for that. 
Well, you know what's so funny? I've only done stand-up paddleboarding for filming of our episodes, you guys. So, <laughs> but I've now done it, I think, four times in France, in New York State, in Virginia. So a couple of different places. And I actually got to go out with a European champion in Brittany, France. And that was later. This was one of my first times doing stand-up paddleboarding. Um, so I was prepared to fall, but my crew did not want me to fall because I was wearing a microphone and they did not want me to get it wet. So I was very trying very hard. And then we just have to say something about um, the Glenn H. Curtis Museum. I was, again, there's so many great museums in this area. And I am a fan of the smaller, more intimate museums where you can actually talk to some of the docents and you really feel like you're getting that intimate experience. Yeah, absolutely. There's, it's a fantastic museum. And I think whether or not you're really interested in, in, you know, the history or the aviation, or you'll, you'll be drawn in to the exhibits. Um, and they're actually today, they were talking about, you know, the seaplanes, you can actually take a ride on a seaplane on Cuca Lake. Uh, there's a company that does that now. So lots of really fun stuff regarding uh, Hammond Square actually under the sign it says wine, wings, and water. So that kind of perfectly encompasses our little town. Well, and our next stop is going to be a museum that I also recommend. And just some of the comments that have come in, Tim is saying great history of flight and where it came from up in the Finger Lakes at Cuca. Derek is saying, I wonder if those vintage historical bikes still run. Just curious. You know what? That would be interesting to, to try out some of those. Um, Cynthia is saying that it's well worth a stop. Fascinating museum. So uh, love it. Uh, love And I love being a pro. Thanks, Cynthia, on the stand-up paddleboarding. But let's take us now all to the Finger Lakes Boating Museum, if you guys are also interested in anything related to the water. And again, history. This is a great stop. From biplanes to boats, another museum worth visiting in Hammondsport chronicles the history of boating in the region over the last century, the Finger Lakes Boating Museum. Museum president Edward Whiteman, who grew up boating in the area, starts us out in the restoration shop. Darley, here in the small boat shop, we restore these old boats and bring them back to what they were. Craftspeople restore and reproduce boats based on historical plans, and travelers can join in, taking part in boat building workshops and demonstrations. The museum also displays over 160 boats from various time periods in multiple buildings. Darley, most people don't even know that there were steamboats on the Finger Lakes. I, I didn't know that. I think uh, of the Mississippi. Surely, <laughs> uh, or the Hudson River or somewhere, yeah. yeah. But no, the, the, this was the mode of transportation for about 100 years, beginning roughly 1830 to 1930. Um, of course, there were no, no roads. These steamboats would carry passengers as well as freight. Lots of competition on the lakes between vying boat companies. So really, it was uh, quite exciting times. In the late 19th century, six steamboats worked Cuca Lake, carrying passengers throughout the year, except when the lake was too icy. For me, in my mind, it's a romantic way to travel. It seems romantic, and these boats, even the replicas are so beautiful. It, it, it really makes me think about the Finger Lakes a little bit differently when I think of that time period. Uh, as we go through the museum, you'll see how we got from where we were with the steamboats up until today. Yeah, it's interesting to think about you know, now people are out on their pontoon boats. You can do, I did some stand-up paddle boarding, but I could have been out on a steamboat back in the day. You could have been. <laughs> Today, many people travel around the Finger Lakes to enjoy wineries. And one of the most important is located on Cuca Lake in Hammondsport. What is that winery, Megan? <laughs> yeah, we're, we're the middle sign there. I'm excited. Yeah, you got your wine. You're all ready, darling. <laughs> so uh, this is another great segment. And again, I really enjoyed touring around with Megan. Um, when, when a place is family run, as you guys know, it's an awesome experience to be meet, meeting one of the family members. And I think that's the cool thing about going to some of these destinations in the Finger Lakes is that you can meet a lot of people that actually run their businesses. These are small local businesses. Um, a lot of them have been family run for a long time. So let's, let's take a look at your, let's take a look at your winery here. Great. Driving further, we reach family-owned Seneca Lodge. Oh, sorry. <laughs> also family-owned. Oh, wait, there's <laughs> more than a museum. Hi, and fucking in Hammond's This is live, folks. This is live. <laughs> 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 Think of the Mississippi. 
Some boats we carry. Oh, wait, I have to do this. Right. Constantine <laughs> Frank Winery. Started by Megan Frank's great grandfather, Constantine, who immigrated to the United States from Ukraine in the 1950s. He was a viticulturist, so he had a PhD, so not a medical doctor. <laughs> so he uh, revolutionized the industry here in the Finger Lakes. He was the first to successfully plant the uh, European species of grape. Many people tried, and they thought it was far too cold. But because he was from Ukraine, he knew that couldn't be the reason, but really due to lack of proper rootstock. Hmm. Dr. Frank began producing Riesling at the vineyard, along with more than 60 wine grape varieties from all over the world, sharing what he learned about what would grow best with neighboring vineyards. This innovative and scientific approach to cultivating grapes continues today with Megan Frank, the fourth generation of her family to work at the vineyard. So we're walking through Riesling right now, but we also do varieties like Arcatzatelli, which is the oldest wine grape. It dates back to 3000 BC. Wow. So we have over 25 different varieties of wine grapes here on the property and many of them are esoteric and unique. Wines so, I've never tried before. <laughs> well, let's change that. <laughs> I'll have to try some. We head inside the tasting room to savor a bit of Megan's family's legacy. Well, this is my first introduction to Finger Lakes wine, so I feel like I've come to a good source for it. I think you have, yes. <laughs> Wonderful. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> So Megan, we have some comments coming in and um, one of them was from Roger saying that Dr. Frank Wine is the best in their history saved an industry. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. Yeah, Constantine certainly was a, a pioneer in his own right. And it's so funny, I still meet people today that you know, 50 years ago met him and they, they talk about it like it was yesterday. And meanwhile, I don't remember what I had for breakfast. So I think that really speaks to, you know, his passion and his pride, you know, for, for growing grapes and making wine. One thing I loved about um, visiting Megan and being at Dr. Constantine Frank Winery is the views. And to me, so I have been over to Wales and it reminded me of some of the Welsh countryside, I thought, where you have these like this greenery flowing down into these beautiful lakes. And you guys are right on the lake. We are. Yeah, certainly. And uh, we, you know, the view really never gets old. It's really gorgeous view, as you mentioned, Darley. And we have a really nice spot because you can see the fork of, we call it the bluff, um, which is where Cuca Lake makes, basically forks out, a really unique vista. And also perfect for planting vines and growing grapes because we use the moderating effect of that deep glacial lake to help us, um, you know, warm the region during the cold winters and cool it down during our hot summers. Well, and we are going to now um, bring on Eric Goldschmidt to join us. Megan is going to go into the waiting room, our green room. We have tons of snacks back there. Megan, <laughs> yeah. and have plenty of wine. 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 It'll be yeah. very comfortable. So everyone's going to hang out in the waiting room and they'll be back on to answer more questions from you guys at the end. If you do have questions, please pop them in live. And actually, I just wanted to do one trivia question before we move on to Eric's segment, because we do have two trivia questions coming your way. And this question, if you guys are paying attention to the show, you might get it. The first one to type it correctly into the chat will be private messaging you, and we will be sending you the Travels with Darlie travel bag and cute luggage tags, as well as a cookbook um, that relates to the Mediterranean cruise all beyond November 2022. If you go to our website, you can see vacation itineraries for cruises, for the Finger Lakes, for the Adirondacks, lots of different places. But who held the fastest man on earth title for four years? If you're typing into the chat, we will see who wins. If you were paying attention to our museum segments, you would have seen this go by. And Good luck, everyone. And Megan, thank you so much for coming on. We're going to bring you back again. and But we're going to move now to Eric because we're going into downtown Corning and we're going to the Corning Museum of Glass, Eric. We're really excited about that. Excellent. Glad to have you. Okay. Well, let's, let's, let's check out the next segment. And Eric is here to answer your questions as well. Next, we're heading into Corning, a charming small city with a walkable downtown where locals and travelers venture into independent shops, galleries, restaurants, and soak in history and art. We're visiting one of Corning's most popular destinations, the Corning Museum of Glass. Museum artist Eric Goldschmidt is leading me there on a walking tour. So you might have heard our nickname, the Crystal City. 
And these buildings here played a, a very big role in that because cut crystal was such a huge industry in this town. And the buildings here that I'm pointing to are the, the old Hawks buildings where TG Hawks and company would cut all sorts of brilliant glass. Talented glass workers from TG Hawks and company created works for illustrious clients, including the White House, employing more than 400 workers by the turn of the century. Corning would take off as a mecca for glass making. Along with TG Hawks and company, Stu Ben Glass Works would get its start in Corning and Corning Glass Works, now known as Corning Incorporated. We continue across the historic Centerway Walking Bridge, past Little Joe Tower, to reach the Corning Museum of Glass. So I'm just gonna pause it here. There are lots of um, shops in downtown Corning, Eric, where you can get things that are locally made, including this glass works. Tell us a little bit about what the downtown area is like for people who haven't been, because it's really charming. We do have a, a wonderful downtown. We actually win a, a fair number of awards through the years for uh, just a, a beautiful small town or the most fun small town in America. Uh, so we have a, a plethora of shops down there, anything from antiques to glass shops, of course, uh, a, a whole bunch of wonderful restaurants and bars down there, and everything continues to thrive, even, even right through these difficult times. So it's uh, just a, a wonderful spot to visit, and of course, we'd love you to, to come see us at the museum as well. And the next segment, you'll see that this is a museum that is very interactive. And you'll see that I will try to create something and Eric is creating some beautiful works here. So let's check it out. Where 35 centuries of glass history is intertwined with modern arts, science, technology, and innovation. And travelers can not only observe glass making through hot glass demos, but actually try their hand at making something too. So this is the nature gallery of our contemporary art and design wing. Here we've got a piece called Forest Glass by <laughs> Catherine Gray. And I don't imagine this is a favorite piece to clean for our curatorial team, mm, but it's yeah. a very important piece of contemporary <laughs> glasswork. Beautiful works abound in the sleek, light-filled contemporary wing, including some surprising finds. It's amazing what can be made out of glass. This, this doesn't even look like glass. Uh, glass is a material with a whole lot of potential to it. I mean, you take a piece like this, there are more than four and a half million glass beads that are all strung together to make a mile long rope right here. And if you took glass for granted before, you most certainly won't entering the hot shop where visitors can observe gaffers, master glass makers honing their craft. I join Eric for a demonstration. So how hot is this flame right now? It's about 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit right now. I feel like you have to be pretty brave to do this job, really. I mean, you're working with this really hot flame <laughs> and hot glass. It is a pretty intense situation. Continuing to... So Eric, tell us how it is. Tell us how this is because I'm watching you do this glass blowing and I'm thinking, ow, please, like, have you, do you get burned a lot? Like how, how, how do you do this so well and, and so easily? I think the, do you get burned is probably the most common question we get as glass blowers. And the, the best thing I can relate it to is working in the kitchen. You know where all the hottest things are. You tend not to get affected by the hottest things. You're not gonna put your hand in the flame. You're not gonna grab the molten glass. But every once in a while, something that heats up around you, you might graze yourself against that. So yeah, we, we get some little things here and there. It, it happens. And so people that are coming to visit this museum, you, you guys see that I'm actually behind the scenes here a little bit um, with Eric while he's doing the glass blowing, but people are actually out in the audience and able to, to watch this demonstration. Yeah, it's the glass making demonstrations are one of the most uh, fascinating parts of the museum. Our, our guests constantly comment about it. And uh, we really use the demonstrations to try to bring our collections to life, to, to give people a, a better understanding of what really goes into all those amazing objects out in our galleries. And there's so many different objects and there's a lot of different exhibits that are at this museum. If you guys are headed up there, this is a really, it's a world-class museum. I was walked in and I was blown away. What's coming up this summer that people can enjoy? We have a, a couple of wonderful new exhibitions that are opening. Uh, we have In Sparkling Company, which covers glass and social life in Britain during the 1700s. 
Uh, so for that exhibition, you're gonna see a lot of the glass that was used for culture and for high society social life in, uh, in 18th century Britain. Uh, things like serving ware, uh, mirrors, which were really being perfected around that time period, uh, different lighting devices. You're gonna see uh, some beautiful clothing that has glass incorporated in it, all sorts of wonderful jewelry. Uh, the other major exhibit that we're opening this summer is called Fire and Vine, the story of glass and wine, which of course the, the Finger Lakes region as we've been covering in the show, wine is a huge part of our culture around here. And this exhibition is really gonna trace glass and its history with wine from about 2,500 years ago, right up until contemporary times. So it's a, a wonderful way to really sort of feel the story of how glass and wine have been partnered together in, in so many ways for many years now. And if you guys are like to be artists or think that art is um, potentially in your future, watch this next segment because it is definitely not in mine. <laughs> to turn the molten glass is critical so that it heats uniformly and doesn't drip. Looks like you're playing a flute. There really are some similarities to playing an instrument. It's a, a very rhythmic thing. I have to blow at the right pace to get the glass to blow out uniformly. Your Christmas tree must have some amazing ornaments. <laughs> <laughs> My family does pretty well with the glass gifts, I would have to say. Eric blows and turns and breaks and shapes what was once a rod into a candy bowl. Voila. So there we go. Beautiful. Thank you. Well, now I'll put it to the test because I'm going to try to make something. Sounds good. I don't think it's going to turn out like that. Eric does have over 20 years experience in glass blowing, and I'm certainly new to the game. Oh. But over in a studio open to visitors, I've signed up for a class where I attempt to make a flower. Ah. Good sound effects. OK, <laughs> let go. OK. OK. okay. Now just smile. <laughs> <laughs> it may not look like a flower Eric would make, but I'm pretty proud of my work and can't wait to take it home. I'm heading back down to Market Street to further explore Corning's Gaffer District, named after those master glassmakers who put Corning on the map with Colleen Fabrizi. So this is Centerway Square. It's the center of our downtown. And way back in the late 1800s, you used to be able to ride your horse and carriage to town and hook up so your horse could have a little drink while you were doing your shopping. It's the watering hole. Yeah, the watering, watering hole. hole. <laughs> That's your average watering hole. <laughs> Many well-preserved 19th century commercial buildings line Market Street, which has earned it recognition on the National Register of Historic Places. Inside, glassmakers still sell their wares. Candy makers feature homemade sweets and galleries mixed with wine bars and farm-to-table restaurants. So I'll take you into hand and foot. It's a really eclectic environment, and the food is just as eclectic, and it's delicious. That's a good combination. <laughs> yes, it is. So Colleen and I enjoy a taste of Corning at a locally-owned restaurant where locally made holds true, much like the rest of downtown Corning, and so much of the Southern Finger Lakes where entrepreneurs, inventors, and craftspeople have inspired generations to ride and fly fast and take advantage of nature's bounty in so many different ways. From vineyards to historic steamboats to stunning waterfalls, this trip through New York's Southern Finger Lakes has been filled with surprising history and natural diversions. I'm Darlie Newman, and thanks so much for joining me in New York's Southern Finger Lakes. And I love that ending sunset because the, this area is just so beautiful. Um, but Eric, we did have someone asking about what is also, if, if you can answer this at the Rockwell Museum, and I'm gonna actually pop everyone back in because we got some questions that we wanna um, add everyone to the stream to answer. Uh, the Rockwell Museum is also right in, uh, in downtown Corning and they cover American Western art. 
So all, all sorts of things uh, from painting to, to sculpture that all represent a sort of culture of Western America. It's a, a, a wonderful museum as well. And, and Dave can attest to this, but you can easily walk, you guys, from downtown. We just went over the bridge to the Corning Museum. The Rockwell Museum is right there. So everything's really walkable. Are there any tips, Dave, that you have for people that are wanting to explore Corning's downtown? Yeah, I mean, uh, well, wear comfortable shoes. No. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's walkable. And Eric, uh, you could probably answer if the shuttle, uh, you know, there's, there's a shuttle from the museum. Is that running right now or? Uh, it is running, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, you can park right across from the Corning Museum of Glass and leave your car there, go to the museum, take a shuttle that takes you right over to the Rockwell Museum. Uh, and also another spot would be on Market Street. So you can leave your car and walk around and explore all day long and then, you know, take the shuttle back uh, before the museums close um, to, to your car. And we do have some questions, but before we get to some of those, and um, I know they're being shared in the chat here. Um, just wanted to throw out one more trivia question that I know everyone who's with us right now can answer, but if you guys were paying attention to Eric's segment, he shared this bit of information. So I'm gonna pop up the trivia question on screen. And again, first person to type it correctly in the chat will be winning some amazing prizes, courtesy of Travels with Darley. But the trivia question is, what was Corning's nickname? Um, it does have something to do with, uh, Glass. So what was Corning's nickname? If you guys can answer that question, type it in the chat and we'll um, we'll be sending you, private messaging you to send you the, the prize the prizes today. And um, Tim is, is asking, what are the different brews that Brett makes and can we find them in town? I know you mentioned that uh, they were gonna be coming to other places soon. Um, we make probably 12 different beers, but we only bottle three or four at a time. At this time, our bottles are only local here at the Lodge and at Wright's Beverage and then Horseheads Discount Beer carry some in Horseheads. But we do have other bars that do pick up our bottles of beer, but you can't purchase them for six packs there. It's just single beers. And then we also have our keg beer in probably 15 to 20 other bars. And if you look on it, website if it's not up yet it'll be up soon where what different places serve our beer and we had a question from bill adams that um maybe dave and megan might be able to both answer this i don't know why megan i'm thinking that you could answer this but we'll see um so i'll let megan try it first how is the antiquing in elmira and corning and maybe can you tell anything about the shopping and things you can buy Sure. Yeah, I was. I saw this comment come in. I was actually excited to see it because there's lots of really good antique shopping and lots of roadside little shops that you know people collect really cool things um, from furniture to you know platewares, um, all sorts of things. Um, so certainly, lots of things that you can find. There's also a pottery trail. Uh, throughout the Finger Lakes, if you like pottery, uh, there's lots of you know different really cool antique finds. Absolutely, Dave and Dave might also be able to tell you because there's you can do the wine trail. You can also do a craft beer experience and trail. Yeah, there are several trails. Um, and there's a, there's a chocolate trail in Corning as well. But yeah, there's there are several wine trails. You know. I think there are over there are over 130 wineries in the Finger Lakes, and just between Seneca Lake and uh, Cuca Lake, there are probably about half of those. You know, or there are probably 60 to 70 of them on those two lakes. So there's there's several trails. Uh, Brett's part of the Craft Your Adventure Trail, which is four counties and about 36 producers of beer, spirits, and a cidery as well. So. Uh, there's actually, I will plug this, there's a Craft Your Adventure app, which is great because people can actually put it on their phones. Um, you know, you're going to Seneca Lodge um, or Watkins Glen State Park, you can type it in and it'll show you right there how far away you are from Brett's Place or some of the other breweries in town um, and uh, what they offer, what kind of beers they specialize in, uh, as well as other outdoor experiences. So it's a great app uh, that's free. And we have um, some comments coming in. Kathy is saying almost every winery brewery has, has guest taps of choices, even non-alcoholic. 
Um, so if you are not a drinker, you can get different choices for beverages in this area for sure. And Marsha is saying that there's a cheese trail in the area as well, which I didn't even know that, Marsha. So thanks for sharing that information. <laughs> And um, if you guys have questions, please type them in the chat. This has been such a great engaging live today with all of you and so many great comments. But I also just wanted to have each of our guests today share one tip that they would give to folks that are going to come to this area for a vacation. Um, you know, whether it's that you should definitely visit their place or that you think they need to spend X number of days. And I will start with Megan on this, not to put you on the spot, but I'll start. Yeah, with no worries. I have lots of advice. Definitely visit Dr. Frank's, of course, but certainly I would recommend having a loose itinerary. Um, there's a lot of very passionate people that live here that would be very happy to kind of give you advice about cool hole in the wall spots, places that only the locals know about. So definitely plan some extra time to visit, you know, those, those fun things. Eric, what, what tips do you have? Well, definitely save plenty of time for us here at the Corning Museum of Glass. Uh, and also, we uh, we do recommend that folks make reservations to see us. So they can go on our, our website at reservations.cmog.org and expect to spend more time here than you ever thought possible. That's uh, one of the most common things we hear is, I had no idea and I wish I planned more time. And Dave, I'm going to throw it to you next and just a comment um, that Kindle Journeys wants to know where they can get more information on the trails. Uh, well, they can go to corningfingerlakes.com and we have some information there. Um, the Craft Your Adventure Trail, you can actually type in fingerlakesbeercountry.com and it'll take you right to a website with that about the app and everything. Um, and I, I agree, like, you know, they're both saying, you know, you really kind of give yourself a little extra time because there's so many things to discover, you know, one of the things about visiting, I think, and tourism is, you know, it's about the experiences you have, but even more than that, it's about the people you meet. And your show really covers that. But the locals really around here in particular just really love each other and, you know, really are supportive of each other. And I, some of those suggestions you can't duplicate, you know, um, so it's, it's really good to give yourself some time. And Brett, I know you've got some insider's insight as well. What, what tips would you give folks that are coming up to the Finger Lakes to have a vacation? I would just say, when you come up to this region, just come to unwind. I mean, when I say unwind, I don't mean to go out and party like a rock star, but just it's more relaxing. Leave the troubles at home and put your feet up and hit the small places and don't don't be in a rush. Don't try to don't try to do five breweries, eight wineries, Corning Museum of Glass, and a glider ride all in one day. You know, just pick a few things. And I mean, there's probably hundreds of other small things we haven't even mentioned today that people can do in the area. There are so many things, and you guys can also check out um, obviously our show and our website at darley-newman.com. We've got information on this trip. We published our itinerary, which you can follow along and do on your own, or if you want to customize it or book it, you can book it through the Darley Vacations travel agent, Kathy Moa, um, who is available to answer questions. I mean, we we love this area and think it's a great place to go, especially spring, summer, and fall, and the changing leaves are really, really beautiful if you're looking at a, a fall trip, especially if you're gonna go to see the waterfalls and drive around, it's a really great area. And um, for those of you who have joined us today, we just had such a great time with you, and I'm so happy that we were able to bring all these amazing locals together who were in our episode, who helped us create the episode, and one place to share their insights into their area. Because as you know, when you meet the locals, when you travel, you really do have the best experience. It's what we love to do when we travel. So thank you, Brett, Eric, Megan, Dave. Thank you guys for joining us today. Um, we are gonna be ending this um, live stream, but please join us for more. We'll be publishing on our events page and in our newsletter. If you don't get it, please subscribe to share with you more great events like this so we can all keep getting inspired for travel as we go on. So everyone say goodbye. Thanks for joining us. Bye, so Bye everyone. See you in the finger. Hopefully later. see you this summer. <laughs> yeah.